Hello, I'm Adrian Gowdy, and in this talk we're going to discuss the evaluation and interpretation of left ventricular function. As with all clinical performed ultrasound, when we do this, we're trying to answer a specific question. And in the setting of a hypotensive or arrested patient, what we're trying to do with the left ventricular function is divide the function into one of four categories. That is, is the heart akinetic with no movement at all? Does it have depressed left ventricular function? Is the left ventricular function normal? Or is it actually hyperdynamic with an increased ejection fraction? And to do this, you need to know what the normal ejection fraction is. And in a normal, healthy heart, it's 55%. That is, 55% of the end diastolic volume is ejected with each beat. So how do we actually do this? Well, to evaluate the function, we recommend that you eyeball it to get a semi-quantitative estimation. Now this has actually been shown to be very accurate for experienced observers. And in fact, up until a few years ago, was the most accurate echo measurement of left ventricular function. That has changed now with improved machines, improved computational power of the machines, but nevertheless, Experienced observers can estimate function usually to within 5, certainly 10% of formal measurements. Now inexperienced observers aren't going to be so accurate, but fortunately for us, we're not trying to get a precise measurement. What we're trying to do is broadly categorise our patients into which of those four groups they fit, so that we can then try and help work on the diagnosis and the treatment. So how do you actually do this? Well, if you ask an expert, they'll tell you that you just look at it while you're doing the scan and you can sort of tell. And that works well if you've got a lot of experience and you're doing a lot of echo and this becomes almost like a subconscious process. But when you're starting out, you need to have an idea of what's the it that you actually need to look for. And the most important thing is to look at the cavity size and the change in the cavity size between diastole and systole. As well, you can then confirm that impression by looking at the mitral valve excursion and by checking that the mid portion is smaller than the base during systole, if it's normal, or that this isn't happening if it's abnormal. If you do want to make a more accurate estimate, then you can use some simple calculations, throw in a few fudge factors, to account for some other variables and come up with a reasonably accurate estimate. But for the vast majority of cases that we're going to be dealing with, we don't need to get anywhere near this level of complexity. So when we look at the left ventricular cavity size, we look at it in all the different views. We generally look at the level of the papillary cordae and for a normal left ventricle in diastole, we expect the cavity size to be between four and five and a half centimetres. Depends on how big the patient is. Uh, there are ways to correlate this to body surface area, but we don't need to worry with that. During systole, this will reduce to between three to four centimetres. Overall, this gives what's known as the fractional shortening, which is the difference between diastole and systole divided by the distance in diastole and that's normally about 30%, so somewhere just under a third. Now you can make a very rough approximation of the ejection fraction by doubling the fractional shortening. Now one of the things you might notice is that when you're looking at the apical four chamber view, the cavity doesn't appear to reduce in size quite as much. And in many cases that's because, depending on your machine and your patient's body habitus and how clear an image you're getting, you often find that the endocardial border is not as well defined. It runs parallel with the ultrasound beam in this view and so technically it's quite difficult for the machines to show it up very clearly or to detect it clearly. And so often if you're thinking in that the apical four chamber view things aren't contracting that well, just check and make sure that you're actually seeing the full thickness and you're not just seeing the edge of the wall or the part of the septum 
and you can't actually see the full endocardial border clearly. So here we have a parasternal long axis from a normal left ventricle. We have the right ventricle here, the left ventricle, the mitral valve, the aortic valve. We just start that playing and we can see the reduction in size. This is a little bit of artifact here, don't worry about this sitting in the middle of the cavity, it's uh, some side beam artifact from the edge of the, the wall. And we can see this reduction here, and so we normally eyeball it at around this level here, through the chordae tendinae near the tips of the mitral valve. And if we do that, and we take a measurement, here is the diastolic measurement, so at the greatest excursion of the cavity, and here is during systole, we can actually see the walls have thickened as well, but the cavity size has reduced, and if we look at those measurements, it's around about a third. If we want more precise measurements, we can look at that in M mode. Now, I don't recommend that you do this, because although it may be more precise, it's not necessarily going to be more accurate, because if your angle is wrong and you're not perpendicular to the long axis of the cavity, you won't be getting an accurate measurement. But nevertheless, if we look at here, we can see here is our diastolic diameter, and here is the systolic diameter, and that gives us a fractional shortening of 33%. There is a slightly more complicated formula than the simple doubling, and that gives us an estimated ejection fraction of 61%. Here we have the apical four-chamber view, left ventricle, right ventricle, right atrium, left atrium with the aortic outflow tract. And as we start playing it, this is the same patient as we've just seen in the previous loop. And what you'll see here is, as I mentioned, there doesn't actually appear to be quite the same level of cavity size reduction in this view. But this is not actually the case because in this view, we're not really picking up the thickening of the septum that we did see in the other view. We're not really seeing a great image of the lateral wall and its thickening. And you often find this on the apical view. And so I don't place quite as much emphasis on it because I know that if I'm not seeing those edges very well, I may well not be properly estimating the cavity size reduction. This is from the subcostal view. Here we have the right ventricle on top near the liver, the left ventricle down here, and we can see the cavity size reduction in here. Not quite as clearly as on the parasternal angle, but nevertheless we can still see that this is contracting normally. Now what about abnormal function? Well, in a hyperdynamic heart, uh, fractional shortening will be greater than a third. And at its extreme, you can sometimes get the septum and the posterior wall virtually touching. And this is sometimes referred to as a kissing ventricle. And if you see this, then that's definitely a sign of a hyperdynamic and generally underfilled left ventricle. So why don't we use this technique for all our estimations of left ventricular function? Well, this is a single two-dimensional measurement that we're taking. As we've mentioned, if it is off-axis, which can happen especially in the M mode, it's not going to be that accurate. If it incorporates areas where there is regional wall motion abnormalities, such as in the setting of ischemic heart disease, then we may underestimate the overall function. Or, if we measure where there are normal motion and don't incorporate those segments where there's abnormal motion, then we may overestimate the function. The other thing is that a larger cavity needs less fractional shortening for the same ejection fraction. And this is why sometimes you'll see in a very dilated heart, there appears to be virtually no movement at all. And you really sometimes wonder, how can there be any cardiac output at all from that part? But, fortunately for us, we're not looking for exact, accurate measurements. 
we just want a broad category to put the patient in. And so these limitations, although important if you're trying to get a precise measurement, aren't actually that important for us. Now, what are the other things we can look at to try and help confirm our estimates? Well, one of those is the mitral valve excursion. And if we look at the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, it opens up towards the septum. And normally, the tip of that valve will go to within less than six millimeters of the septum. And the overall opening between the anterior and the posterior leaflets is greater than a centimeter. If there is greatly reduced cardiac output and flow through the heart, then the valve won't open as fully. Now that of course assumes that you've got a normal mitral valve because if you have nitral stenosis for example then the valve won't open fully but it's not because of the poor function it's because of pathology of the mitral valve. In a normal ventricle if we look at the mid cavity size and compare it to the base of the ventricle then we'll see that the mid cavity is smaller during systole. Now in hearts with various sorts of diseases which become dilated you often see the reverse happening and there's a much more globular shape and the mid cavity bows out. Now sometimes this can be due to global problems or it might just be due to a regional wall motion abnormality due for example to a previous myocardial infarct. In all of these cases this suggests that the heart does have some disease and is likely to have reduced left ventricular function. So let's have some examples of these things. Here is a subcostal view and here the first thing we can note is that this is an akinetic heart. Here's the right ventricle, the left ventricle here and there is virtually no movement whatsoever. We can see a little bit of flotation of the tricuspid valve leaflets just flapping back and forth a very small amount. But this is an asystolic, sorry, an akinetic heart. If we look here, on the other hand, this is an elderly man who presented with hypotension and a fever. And here is a subcostal view. We can see here's the right ventricle, here is the left ventricle, and we can see there's good thickening, lots of movement, a small cavity size if anything, and this is a hyperdynamic heart. Here we have the parasternal long axis, left atrium, aorta, aortic valve, left ventricle here, and here we can see very little movement and certainly less than the third of fractional shortening that we would expect. This man was actually sent in because of increasing shortness of breath over the last few weeks for evaluation for recurrent PEs. We performed this examination and what we saw was that his problem wasn't a primary lung problem, it was a primary cardiac problem. If we look here at the mitral valve, we can see that there is reduced opening. It's not swinging up and coming within six millimeters of the septum up here because of his poor cardiac output. We have a look, this is the parasternal short axis view from the same patient and we can see although there's a little bit of shortening in this axis here, there's virtually none in this axis here. And so when we're trying to estimate his function we can say it is overall very depressed. If we wanted to be a little more precise, in our minds we'd average out the movement in this axis and the movement in this axis to get a better estimate but we're not really concerned about that. Some people suggest that we actually trace this around and we can use the area and the reduction in the cross-sectional area, but I'm not sure it gives you any more, any better or more information than just looking at the single linear dimensions. The other interesting thing that we saw in this patient, just as a sideline, is when we looked at his apical view, we actually saw an echogenic mass which was a thrombus sitting down at the apex of his left ventricle because of his poor function.
this is from a different patient. This is a patient who was septic. It's not leaking, unfortunately. And we can see here that these are the, this is the septum, this is the posterior wall, and as it leaps through, they virtually tuck. And so this is what we refer to as the kissing ventricle, and this is a sign of a relatively underfilled ventricle that is hyperdynamic. Now, if you want to be a little more precise in terms of making our estimates from that information we've got on the two-dimensional fractional shortening, then we can incorporate these fudge factors. As I said, normally it doesn't make much difference to us because we're not trying to make a precise estimate. We're just trying to make a very broad judgment as to which category our patient falls within in terms of their left ventricular function. We've already mentioned regional wall motion abnormality and that you have to take all those views with the fractional shortening and if there are areas of regional wall motion abnormality that we haven't included in our measurement then we might push down our estimate of the function. If however we take a measurement on an area that does have a regional wall motion abnormality but we know that the rest of the heart is normal then we might increase our estimate of the overall function. But because looking at regional wall motion abnormality is actually quite difficult, it takes a lot of experience, don't get caught up in this, don't try too hard to be too precise because until you get a lot of experience you won't be very good at it. It will come with experience if you start doing a lot of this but as I said most of the time it doesn't make much difference to us. As we've also already mentioned, if there is a dilated left ventricle, although the fractional shortening may not be as much, there will be higher overall function for a given or fractional shortening than with a small cavity. And this is one of the reasons why the Frank Starling curve exists, because as the ventricle dilates for the same amount of fractional shortening, you get an increased ejection fraction. The more tachycardic the patient is, the more difficult it is to judge what the overall function is. And so the faster they're going, the harder it'll be, the more cautious you should be in your estimates. And for example, if you have a patient in, say, atrial flutter or with a rapid sinus tachycardia around 160, 170 beats a minute, it is very, very difficult to make any sort of accurate judgment on the overall function. If the patient is on inotropes, that also can make the judgment more difficult diagnostically, in particular if you're asking, is this a normal left ventricle? Because then you're asking as well, how would the normal left ventricle respond to these drugs that we are giving as well? So, once we've got that information, what does it all mean? Well, in the hypovolemic, the septic, or the patient with anaphylaxis, you'd expect a small left ventricle which is hypodynamic. All of these cases will give you hypovolemia or relative hypovolemia. Some of them will also give you peripheral vasodilation which will reduce both your preload and your afterload. And so we expect to see a small left, left ventricle which is working really, really hard. In a massive PE, as you'll see in one of the other talks, you'll expect to see a small left ventricle, which is hypodynamic, but with a dilated right ventricle. In a patient with cardiogenic shock, then you will expect to see reduced left ventricular function. Now, all that sounds wonderful, and for a patient who is previously fit and well, with only a single disease process, that is what you will see. But, like everything in medicine, things are often not quite that simple. And so, for example, if you have a patient who has previous cardiac problem, whose left ventricular function normally is depressed, then they may not be able to generate the sort of response that you might otherwise expect. 
So a patient who's got a long history of ischemic heart disease, whose normal ejection fraction is, say, 25%, who develops sepsis, may not become hyperdynamic because their heart is just not capable of becoming hyperdynamic no matter how much endogenous catecholamine and endogenous stimulation it's getting. But in terms of our decision as to whether to use inotropes or whether to give fluid, and this is often the question that we're trying to answer by performing this examination, this often doesn't necessarily matter because if the patient's left ventricle is poor and they are hypotensive, then we're going to move to using inotropes a lot earlier than if it is hyperdynamic and underfilled when we will move to using fluid. We'll take into account the other information we'll get, which we'll hear from uh, the other talks about fluid assessment, for example. But it all goes into the mix to try and help that initial decision. Do we go more fluid or do we go for inotropes? So in conclusion, what we're aiming to do here is a semi-quantitative estimation of left ventricular function to place our patient into one of four groups. A hyperdynamic left ventricle, normal left ventricle, depressed left ventricular function, or akinesis. And by placing them into one of those groups, that will help with both our diagnostic process to work out what the underlying cause is, and our treatment. Thank you very much and we'll see lots more examples of these cases and these types of scenarios during the course. We look forward to seeing you then.